Welcome to another edition of our Dan Education Series. In this edition, we're going to be talking about a controversial subject, the subject of a patent for Rama Navale, or potential hole in the heart. Keep watching. We're talking about patent for Rama Navale in this episode. But what is a patent for Rama Navale? Well, one needs to understand why we have such a thing in the first place. And the reason why there is a shortcut or a potential hole or flap between the left and right side of the heart is that because prior to birth, oxygenated blood actually flows from the mother through the placenta to the heart and then from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart to actually get to the rest of the baby's circulation. So this trapdoor, if you like, is necessary in the unborn child to actually ensure that they get enough oxygen. At birth, the lungs expand and the pressure in the heart changes and the left atrium then increases in pressure and, as it were, slams shut the foramen ovale. So this door fuses and closes, but it may not always fuse completely. And in roughly a third of people, a patent foramen ovale, as it is called, or PFO, may continue existing. Now, is this an issue when it comes to diving? Well, consider this. In people who have a patent for Ramana Vale, which is still a loose flap, if the pressure on the right side of the heart rises above the pressure on the left side of the heart, it is now possible that when bubbles return from the venous circulation back to the lungs to be exhaled, then they may move over to the left side of the circulation and that is the part of the circulation that goes to the heart and to the brain and other organs of the body. And that's when we become concerned. It may not only be limited to bubbles, the same can happen with blood clots, in which case it may actually cause a stroke or as many divers experience, frequent migraine attacks. Now with that theory in mind, what do epidemiological studies have to say about that? In other words, what do the numbers say? What is the suggestion in terms of the risk of a patent for Ramana Vale and certain types of decompression illness? And this is an important point because not all forms of decompression illness are associated with the foramen ovale. In fact, it is largely very high, in other words, upper brain and skin decompression illness, as well as inner ear decompression illness, that is more commonly associated with the patent foramen ovale. And this is something that divers and diving physicians should keep in mind. The decompression sickness risk in recreational divers has been reported at around 3.6 cases per 10,000 dives, with 0.84 or nearly 1% of those cases being neurological in nature, so about 1 in 10,000. Now the incidence of PFO, you might remember, is about a third of people, but it's not a third of divers that get decompression illness, so clearly having a PFO is not a guarantee to get decompression illness, but it may increase the risk slightly. And it's important to know when that is the case and what to do about it. Because some individuals with patent for Ramana Ovale do seem to have slightly higher risks. There are some guidelines for testing patent for Ramana Ovale, aiming at identifying such individuals and helping them manage their decompression sickness risk. The following guidelines were developed 
from a joint position statement on PFO and diving published by the South Pacific Underwater Medical Society or SPUMS and the United Kingdom Sports Diving Medical Committee as well as a DAN sponsored workshop held in conjunction with the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society annual general meeting in Canada, Montreal in 2018. First question, who should be tested for PFO? It was agreed that routine screening for patent foramen ovale at the time of a diving medical fitness assessment, either initial or periodic, is not indicated. Consideration should be given to testing for PFO where there is a history of more than one episode of decompression sickness, especially when the high parts of the spinal cord, brain, ears or frequent skin manifestations, particularly the marbled skin uh, manifestations, become uh, commonplace or are recognized. Non-skin manifestations or so-called mild decompression illness such as was discussed in the remote decompression illness workshop are not typically associated with a patent for Raman Ovale and are not an indication for PFO assessment. Headache as an isolated symptom after diving is not an indication for PFO investigation. How about PFO testing and evaluation recommendations then? When and how should this testing be undertaken? Well, first of all, testing should be undertaken by centers who are well practiced in the technique. The testing must include bubble contrast, ideally combined with trance thoracic echo, and the use of a two dimensional color flow echocardiogram with and without bubble contrast. However importantly only looking at color flow the color Doppler flow without bubble contrast is considered inadequate. The test must include the use of provocation maneuvers in other words maneuvers that would promote right to left shunting and these include doing a Valsalva and then releasing or sniffing as described in the references that are given at the end of this presentation. If one then sees a densely opacified, in other words a left side of the heart filled with bubbles, that is evidence of a transfer of bubbles from the right to the left side of the heart. So what does a positive test mean? Will a spontaneous shunt or a large provoked shunt following diving with venous gas emboli present is recognized as a risk factor for certain forms of decompression sickness. As we mentioned specifically brain high spinal, ear and marbling of skin. Smaller shunts are not closely associated with decompression sickness and are less likely to need occlusion. Detection of a PFO after an episode of decompression sickness does not necessarily guarantee that it was the PFO that contributed to the decompression sickness. So now, what are the options for divers who test positive? Following the diagnosis of a PFO that is more likely to be associated with increased decompression sickness risk, a diver may consider some of the following options in consultation with a diving physician and cardiologist. One option, of course, is to stop diving which for most divers would seem a bit extreme. The second is dive more conservatively and there are various strategies that might be employed that reduce the risk 
of significant venous bubble formation after diving or subsequent right to left shunting of bubbles across a PFO or for that matter through the lungs because remember the lungs may also be relatively ineffective in eliminating bubbles so it's not only about the heart the appropriateness of the approach of these strategies needs to be considered on an individual basis with a diving medical expert other examples of reducing risk may include staying well within accepted no decompression limits performing only one dive per day using nitrox as air and lengthening safety stops or time at the shallower depths avoiding excessive exercise and avoiding unnecessary straining or lifting for at least three hours after diving. Should a PFO be closed? Well, when is it appropriate for PFO to actually be closed? The options should be considered very carefully because the closure itself is not necessarily a guarantee and it is a procedure that has its own implications. Not only does the procedure itself have a certain amount of risk, but it isn't necessarily a guarantee that it will be successful. So, after a PFO closure procedure, there should be a repeat bubble contrast echocardiogram demonstrating that the shunt is closed. And this should be performed a minimum of three months after the PFO has been closed and diving should not be resumed until this has been verified. Until then it is customary for divers to also be on antiplatelet medication and aspirin is quite common and acceptable. Note that if we limit venous bubbles in other words the bubbles that we're concerned about that may shift from the right to the left side of the heart then we have essentially eliminated the concern about a PFO or even a so-called transpulmonary shunt. So if in the absence of excessive exercise or other straining maneuvers and other provocative activities that may open a patent for Ramonovale the risk of a PFO precipitating decompression sickness becomes very small indeed. So finally, what are the facts that divers need to remember about PFOs and diving? Well, divers with a PFO have a two and a half times greater risk of decompression sickness than divers without a PFO and a four times greater risk of neurological decompression sickness. But remember now, again we're talking between one and four per 10,000 dives. So twice the risk is still a very, very low number. The absolute incidence of neurological decompression sickness in divers with PFO is estimated at around 4.7 cases of decompression sickness per 10,000 dives. A major study at the Mayo Clinic by Hagen determined that PFOs may change over time. In young people they're around 25% and they may increase over time. But there have been subsequent studies that have shown that sometimes PFOs appear or disappear, enlarge or become smaller over time. And therefore a single test at a specific period of time, at a certain given point of time, does not necessarily guarantee that that will always be the case. So one should be cautious about being overly concerned about a patent for Ramonavale. The greatest risk of decompression illness clearly is with the individuals with the largest PFOs, but not the entire population in other words, the 25% of the population with PFOs have large ones. If decompression illness, particularly brain, spinal, skin 
and any a decompression illness has occurred, there might be a link. And in those cases, up to 74% may have a patent for Amenavale. And that may be an indication for closure. There are factors necessary for PFO to contribute to decompression illness. It needs to be large, there need to be venous gas emboli, and the bubbles need to cross either through the PFO or through the heart and go through the left part of the circulation to the brain or heart, the vulnerable organs. And this does not necessarily happen. There are many precautions divers can take and therefore a balanced view on patent foramen ovale and fitness to diving should be considered. We'd like to refer you also to a resource, Divers Alert Networks Workshop in 2015 by De Noble, Holm, et al. on patent foramen ovale and fitness to dive a consensus workshop and of course if you in need of medical advice or would like to know more don't hesitate to contact us through the various social media call the Dan hotline follow us on Twitter and Facebook and remember to sign up on this channel thank you